Tonight we're going to talk about deliverance. So when I started, I was thinking, Lord, where should I start? There's so much to deliverance ministry. And I think I shared with you last week how I ended up in it. Um, things just started happening. If God has a call in your life to deliverance ministry, you're going to find yourself encountering things in the supernatural realm and the spiritual realm that you never encountered before. And it's going to seem a little weird. But if the Lord has a call on you for that type of ministry, he's going to teach you. You don't need to chase after it uh, until the point that you become very clear that this is what he's calling you into. And this is not a ministry for everyone. Not everybody's called to deliverance ministry, to be a deliverance minister. But everyone is called to allow the Lord to deliver and free them, as we read in Isaiah 61, to set us free from bondages and strongholds. But you can't get better if you don't know what the problem is. So part of what we do is sit down when we engage in deliverance and talk with people, and they say, I'm stuck in my spiritual walk. So I'll have some people go out and say, I just can't seem to get engaged. I fall asleep when the pastor preaches. I can't read my Bible. And so over the years, I've learned there are certain things we look for and ask questions. And I'm going to give you an overview of that inventory tonight. But I received an email from one of my favorite authors, Francis Frangipane. And Every once in a while, I get a little blurb that comes from his office. And this one I thought fit and was a good uh, introduction to deliverance ministry. And he, he entitled it, The Lord Whose Sword is Drawn. And he says, of all the names that the Heavenly Father could have given his son, it's most significant that he chose the name Jesus, because Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. And we all know that Joshua was the Hebrew general who led God's people into war. To be prepared for the victories ahead, we're going to need a greater revelation of who Jesus is. And we need to see him as he's going to be revealed in the last moments of this age. He is going to be dressed as a holy warrior prepared for battle. And in Revelation, I I've said to some of you before, when you think of Jesus, I don't know if you think of the baby in the man manger or you think of the Savior on the cross. When I think of G Jesus, and since he's made his call clear on my life, this is how I see him. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. It says, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And a name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. That's the Jesus who's calling us into battle. And in Joshua 5, when we go back and look at Joshua, Joshua 5, verses 13 to 15. It says, when Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you a friend or a foe? Neither one, he replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. And at this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Will you recognize Jesus when he comes, do you think? Will you really know him? Joshua walked up and said, Who are you, friend or foe? There's something about the time that's just prior to a move of God, and we are standing on the threshold of a mighty move of God. I've been saying that for years. I'm still saying it, and it's closer now than it's ever been. But there's something about the time just prior to a move of God that causes many of us to wonder if the Lord is for us or against us. 
Who is he anyway? I, I don't feel like he's here. Where is he? He seems almost confrontational sometimes, too intense, too different from the Jesus we learned about in Sunday school. Who is this warrior armed for battle? Yet during these last few years, this is exactly the Lord's relationship with his church. The Lord has been standing before us with his sword drawn, and he's calling us to follow him into war. Perhaps you've been going through a time where it seemed like the very tip of Christ's sword is poking right in your heart. Let me reassure you, God is for you. He's not against you. In fact, his whole purpose is to release that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, through your words and your prayers. I've talked to some of you about the power of prophetic utterance, some of you who have prophetic giftings. And when you open your mouth and declare something, it carries spiritual authority and weight. But before the Lord's sword is going to come through your mouth, before you can command anything in the name of Jesus, before you can declare and take authority over something, that sword is going to go through your heart first. Don't think you're going to be able to utter the words if it hasn't pierced here. And you'll know when it's pierced here. It's not a fun process because sometimes you'll think, God, what are you doing? I thought you were all about my, for me to be happy and love me and be kind and gentle. You have to die to self. That means literally climbing up on that altar and saying, whatever you have me to do, I'll do it. And I, you didn't say it was going to feel good all the time. There will be a price to be paid. So don't be terrified and don't withdraw when Christ wants to unveil this part of his nature to you. For he is in fact fitting you and preparing you for battle. By the time you're fully trained, you will be a fearless warrior in his army. But you have to be realistic about your current state because most of us have been pampered and spoiled as Christians. We've become lazy and undisciplined in our spiritual walk. We have not understood the day of warfare that's looming in front of us. Nor are we prepared for the final raging of Satan as his time gets shorter. Revelation 12.12 12 tells us that. That he's going to get really nasty because his time's short. Isaiah 42.13 tells us that the Lord is going to go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout, he will raise a war cry, and he will prevail against his enemies. We have all known the Lord as our Savior and our Shepherd and our friend and our Comforter. And these revelations of our Master are true, but there's still another nature to him. And this new nature is so startlingly different from how we've known him in the past. But be of good cheer because this frightening warrior king with his sword drawn and with a shout of war on his lips is the same blessed Savior who died on the cross for your sin. But truthfully, there's no way to soften the shock of this vision of Christ. Our immediate reaction might be similar to Joshua's. Our viewpoints and our doctrine are going to get shaken up and our fears are going to get exposed and confronted when we start moving into this aspect of the Christian walk. If you look again at Joshua, he'd already known the Lord in a wonderful, intimate way. He'd spent time with him in the tabernacle. But now, standing in front of him was a new revelation of the Lord. The Son of God had come as a captain of the host to lead his people into war. And though initially Joshua was scared, both he and the people with him were more prepared for the battle than they realized. Their time in the wilderness had conditioned them for war. Some of you have been going through some things in the past year, two, three, four, five. <laughs> They've been conditioning you for war. And you don't understand that he's been preparing you and getting you ready. This new unveiling of the Lord is holy. Overnight, if you remember, the Lord brought down the atheistic community in the former Soviet Union. And since then, hundreds of millions of people from nations have found salvation in the Son of God. Right now, God is touching the nations, and we should not be criticizing what we don't understand. We are just now beginning to perceive him as he truly is, and as he's going to be released in these last days. He is the Lord of hosts. Do you know, I looked it up, I'd heard that the Lord is called the Lord of hosts more than any other title in scripture. Um, it's over 300 times in the King James alone. 
the Lord God of hosts, the Lord the God of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the God of hosts, the captain of the angel armies. More than 300 times. This is the Jesus you need to focus on when we're talking about deliverance. So, I need, right here, your empty cup. And some of you have seen me do this umpteen times, but I'm going to explain it. As we talk about deliverance, here's a person. Here's Kim. But this is a spirit that flows through Kim. And you know what? Sometimes there can be more than one. And if the enemy has a stronghold somewhere in her, let's say bitterness, and that thing rears its ugly head, and I see this because people who have spiritual sight see the spirit that's talking and moving. So I'm supposed to war against this in the spiritual realm, but I'm always supposed to use a towel, and that means servanthood toward the person. Because what happens if you're young in this, and I've had people say, what happens when you see a spirit? You don't always talk to it. You see it and you leave it alone. Because if I try to attack that thing and I start yelling at her, because I see this thing in her eyes, and I start demanding this and that and taking authority in Christ, you know what happens? Is this thing disappears and there's Kim left looking at me saying, why are you yelling at me? What do you mean so nasty for? There are, there are ways to learn to handle this. And the way you fight in the spiritual realm is not the way you fight in the natural realm. To be honest, when God wants to show you things in the spirit, you're going to usually have to do the exact opposite of what your flesh wants to do. Because spirit will get in your face and want to engage you, and it will push all your buttons, and you're going to want to explode, and you're going to want to say things. But if you know you're dealing with spirit, you have to be quiet, and the Lord will tell you when to speak and what to say. But if you're not able to hear his voice, that's going to be a problem. So... <coughs> I'm talking about this. God loves all people, and a sign of an immature prophetic gift is somebody who walks into a room and says, oh, I see what's over here. I see what's over here. I can feel it. Oh, it's icky. And there's stuff over here. That's an immature prophetic gifting. A mature prophetic person can walk up and say, oh, Kim's got a little jealousy over here, a little bitterness over here, but wow, she got a call from the Lord. She's gifted. She's called to worship. She's got a prophetic gift. We got to get that out. We got to call out that call that's on her and all the gifts. And I don't really care about those other little things because if I point her to Jesus and she gets close to him, he's going to take care of those things. He'll deal with that. It'll come out. Now, I've told you I've been in deliverance ministries where I've seen people stand somebody up and they encircle them and they yell at that spirit of confusion and that deaf and dumb spirit to come out for hour after hour after hour. That's kind of exhausting. And like I said, you end up having to do it again every few months if somebody doesn't uh, chase after Jesus. So what I've learned for me, because you're going to talk to a lot of people with different opinions, you point people to Jesus, you build relationship, you extend truth, love, and the fruit of the Spirit, and the enemy cannot stand where he's encountering grace and love and truth. And as you learn this, oops, you will make some mistakes, but that's okay. You have to practice somewhere. We're always to use the fruit of the Spirit when dealing with people. Don't ever forget that. 